one act too far. We have a conversation on that tonight. Stay with us here on your the National Democratic Congress NDC welcomes the decision by the Electoral Commission of Ghana to furnish the parties with the correct provisional voters register and also to re-exhibit the register. We have this and more from the IPAC meeting earlier today. Stay with us here on your election command center. Stay on this. The latest poll gives NDC's John Mahama a one-touch victory in the December poll. What dynamics played out in his favor? Mosa Dankwa joins us tonight for a conversation as always. We have manifesto check here on your election command center. You're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana briefs. Organized Labour has declared a nationwide strike on Thursday, October 10. The strike is to demand that government bans Kalamse and small-scale mining. Spokesperson of Organized Labour, Joshua Ansa, asked all workers to join the strike. Following the expiration of our deadline and the failure of government to meet our demands on illegal mining, that is Kalamse, Organized Labour has decided to declare a nationwide strike we defer from October 10th, 2024. We are therefore calling on all workers to stay at home starting Thursday, October 10th, 2024, until government accedes to our demands. Former National Security Minister Kofito Tobi Kwache has issued a strong warning to the government to refrain from intimidating Ghana's youth. He believes the recent arrest of Democracy Hub protesters was a tactic to silence young voices and express concern that innocent citizens are languishing in cells while Galamse perpetrators roam free. Since the way why the Amazon is that whether we use one or the chair, the young people of this country. The Anipiaya coalitions, no, Nessa Wakaya, one the Manzamani Bio, no young people, no, would a Gumanda. They are warning them the Wabachiro one. But I can tell you, this year, 2024, is not 2020. I am telling you, they try it. What they will see is something that they don't want to see. The register is clean, robust, and ready for election 2024. That's according to the Electoral Commission as it addressed concerns of the NDC at an inter-party advisory committee, IPAC meeting. Responding to the NDC's allegations, chairperson of the Electoral Commission affirmed that the current provisional register has been significantly updated and is more accurate than the previous version. Over the last few weeks, the commission has employed, tried and tested legal and administrative processes to clean the provisional register and rid it of discrepancies as envisaged by the framers of the 1992 constitution. We can confidently state that most of the discrepancies discovered to date have been resolved. The NPP says the NDC has no legitimate grounds to return with complaints and anomalies following the Electoral Commission's latest presentation. Speaking after an inter-party advisory committee IPAC meeting, the General Secretary of the NPP dismissed the NDC's long-standing grievances, asserting that their claims against the voters' register have now been thoroughly debunked. For the issue that they are talking about, it's something that is very common doing provisional register exercise. So all the issues that they raise, if something that happens during voter exhibition, is something that gives us opportunity to look at it. Now you don't, you just don't draw a conclusion and start attacking an institution. And when you are asked to bring your data, you say, no, I don't bring the data.
presidential candidate of the NDC, John Mahama, has charged religious leaders to show interest in social political activities in the country. At a meeting to engage the clergy, he charged them to speak up about the events leading to the elections and after. I think that our clergy should get involved in the processes of the election. Nothing stops you from sending representatives as observers to the coalition centers, to the polling stations to see how the count is going on. Nothing stops you from tallying the results yourself, putting in a tally system so that you can also tally the results so that when uh, there's controversy between us about what the results are, you will also be able to say, well, from the tally we got, uh, we think that this is what's um, the well, this morning is on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next. Latest polls gives NDC's John Mahama a one-touch victory in the December. Poll, what dynamics really played out in his favor? Musa Dankwa, uh, the executive director of Global Info Analytics, is going to be joining us for a conversation in a bit to, as it were, get into the issues and what went into this particular conclusion, as we are seeing right now, and uh, the matters at, at play, especially with some 70 three days to election day December 7 today is October 1 now the conversation that is brewing now is exactly how things are going to play out especially if this trend is going to remain the same or these persons who were surveyed will change their minds that's the question according to Musa Dankwa's poll that was released earlier today some 8,206 persons were surveyed in this poll 8,206 respondents 7,509 out of the 8,206 respondents in this poll answered all the questions. That's about 92% of the completion rate and the margin of error of about 1.49%. That's according to Musa Dankwa document. Now, with this 8,206, they were spread across all the 16 regions. And he gave the breakdown as this, that in fact, the Greater Accra region had the highest number of respondents in this poll and that's what you see displayed in this bar graph representation as we have it followed by the ashanti region second highest with 1373 of the respondents and it follows in that order eastern central western and the northern region following that order in fact the northeast region had the lowest number of respondents in this poll with some 149 of them. And now that leads us to some of the questions that he asked these respondents. The first was about the assessment of the performance of the current NPP administration led by Nana Drankwe Kofuado. And this, this were the respondents' own verdict on this, the direction of the country. He asked a specific question. There were, in, in July this year, 63% of the respondents said the country was headed in the wrong direction. Fast forward to October 2024, 62% of the respondents say heading in the wrong direction. And 27% in July said the country is heading in the right direction. Guess what? In October 2024, 31%, that's an increase of about four percentage points between July and October. 31% say their country is headed in the right direction. There are about 10 people percent of the persons who said in July that they don't have an opinion well guess what that has also reduced to about seven so you can understand what that means is that those who said they didn't have an opinion in the month of July in October they had an opinion but it swung in the favor of Nana Dodonkwe Kofuado saying they're going in the right direction but that question about the president's job approval as to whether president is doing as expected you see a, a slight dislike that's some linkage in there there were about 35% of the respondents in July who in 20, July 2024 said the approval of the president's job is doing well, is doing good. Well, guess what? In July, that's in October 2024, 36% say he's not. That's an increase of about one percentage point. If you look at that, those who disapprove of his job in July, 60% said, well, you know what? They do not approve of his job. He's not doing well as president. October, that dropped to 59%. Those who say they don't have an opinion still say the same. But this question about which of the following will have greater influence on how you vote 
in the 2024 election, the 8,206 respondents say the current economic conditions will be the major driver in their decision making as to who to vote for, the current state of the economy. So you hear some of the political parties adopt the Shewa Sitine Munatu about that kind of um, campaign mantra. Now, if you look at it, the next issue is the past performance of the political parties. That's going to be the next major consideration for them, the people who were surveyed in this uh, poll. And then the third is the credibility of the candidates as well. They look at the party's manifesto comes in fourth. And the fight against illegal mining is in there as one of the considerations for the persons who were surveyed, that they will look at how this Galamse fight is being fought and, and we're getting to it as we go on because there are some others who also have a few thoughts to share as to how the fight against illegal mining will influence their decision on who to vote for. Then it went to if elections were held in October, that's today, October 1, who were the respondents going to vote for? Guess what? These were the responses that Global Info Analytics got. 53% of the respondents said they're going to go vote for John Mahama if elections were held on this, this, this today, October 1. 36% Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, 7% Alan Kojo Tremanti, and Nana Kwame Bidiako, Cheddar comes in that order with 3%. And then we wanted to understand how if we do a month-on-month -month analysis whether there's been some significant change. Because in July, according to the respondents, 51% of the respondents in July said if elections were held, then we we're going to vote for John Mahama. Fast forward, there's been 0.05% increase for John Mahama in October, but a 0.95% decrease for those who said we we're going to vote for Dr. Mahamud Obamia if elections were held either in July or October. So that's the change in the polls between July and October as things are playing out right now. So we ask specific questions as to exactly how the situation will be for the next couple of months ahead of us, because roughly we have about, you know, maybe nine weeks they're about to go into this election, December 7. And Musa Dankwa is the Z director of Global Info Analytics is joining us on Zoom. Mr. Dankwa, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First off, I see as we put on the screen right now, this percentage point increase, and, and it's a positive change for John Mahama, and then also we see that dip for Dr. Mahmoud Bami, and it casts across all the 12 regions. What could have accounted for this? Um, Mahama largely remained flat overall. He made some gains elsewhere and lost elsewhere, but overall the numbers moving up, and he was flat. He was just up by 0.05% which is very insignificant. Um, the movement we saw in the poll between July and uh, September uh, were largely in the corner of Alan Chiramachin and, the, uh, and Baumia, who lost grounds. And then those losses went to Tanaku and Bediako and, and some of the new candidates. Now, what caused it? We've seen some movement uh, among younger voters. Um, whereas in the last period, um, Baumia was at par with first-time voters. He has lost grounds among these first-time voters, and Mama is now leading first-time voters. So that is one of the reasons that we saw uh, we saw in the poll. And then again, on the religious front, we see Baumia losing grounds among the Muslims vote, and then uh, Bahama gaining some grounds. And I think these were the key main drivers of changes we saw in the poll between the period. Not forgetting that in the Ashanti region, Nanakwam uh kind of got a lot more vote from Alan because Bama and Mahama and Baumia were flat in the Ashanti region, whereas Bedia increased the share in the Ashanti region through a loss of 4% from Alan. And then finally, in the Eastern region, uh, Baumia dropped from 49 to 20, uh, 42%, and those gains went to Mahama uh, Alan and Anakwan Bidiako. So you can see that MPP dropped quite a bit in the, uh, in the Eastern region, and Alan dropped a bit 
in the Shantiri uh, 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 I see. Yeah, but Mr. Dankwa, it's an interesting point that you make about the loss of grounds by Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya in some Muslim communities. And we want to interrogate that a bit further as we go on. But then again, it appears based on what you have just showed us in this latest poll that Nana Kwame Bediako, I mean, call him Cheddar, is proving to be a potent force going into this election, is it not? Yeah, I mean, he's getting the backing of younger voters, people who are below the age of 30 years or 34 years. And these voters account for about 50% of the voting population. So when you get support from this group, certainly he's going to give you uh, some numbers up. Interestingly, he's doing 10% among first-time voters, which is quite significant. I see. And you're saying this trend, from what we are seeing, this trend, based on the interaction you had with them, is not likely to change in the next weeks ahead of us into December 7? Um, you see, uh, there will be some movement here and there, but it will not be much, uh, significant. Where the polling numbers are, we've seen it remain stable. Um, if you look at the data that we've published so far, you only see 1% here, 2% there, 1% there. You don't see dramatic changes in the numbers, and that's what tells me that the numbers are stable. And interestingly, for those who say that they are not going to change their mind, as to who they will vote for. It was 71% in, in, in July. It is now 73%, up 2%. It means people are really firming up their position. They're not changing positions. And that is what could be worrying for the parties who are behind. I if see. you are behind in the polls and mm -hmm. people have already made up their mind, then you are in trouble. Well, but then again, so you're saying that even with 13 presidential candidates going into this election, a party can still win one touch of the first round, regardless of the numbers of the presidential candidates we are seeing right now who would also draw votes, you know, for themselves from other places? Yeah, I believe so. There's no doubt in my mind that it will be a, a first, first round win. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because if you look at the, 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 the demography of people who in 2020 put it for an ad, it's very important to understand how they are voting. For those who in 2020 went for Nanago, um, about 19% of them are voting for Mahama. That's a switch of 19% among just those groups. And if you look at among first-time voters, it's leading 48%. So if you are winning among the older voters, you are winning uh, from the first-time voters, it means you are, you are winning the election. It's as simple as that. I see. And as, as simple as you look at it. But then again, I know that we understand there's going to be a, a, a last poll from you as well before December 7. We'll look at that and see how, whether there's going to be any significant change in the trends as we have it right now. Because from, between July and October, as you have just showed us, there was relatively insignificant change in the trends for especially the two leading political parties and how Nanakwa and Bidiakun is also feeding in and into into the two parties and especially Alan Chimantin's votes as well. And those parties as concerned will we'll take a look at how things are playing out. I appreciate your time. Musa Dankwa is as a director of Global Info Analytics and will remain your election command center. This is your election command center. Coming up next, the National Democratic Congress was welcoming the decision by the Electoral Commission of Ghana to furnish the parties with the corrected provisional voters register and also to re-exhibit the register. There's going to be more from this IPAC meeting held earlier today. And first off, let's hear from the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Jane Adokwe Mensa, who has reiterated the commission's position that the current provisional register has been significantly updated and is more accurate than the previous version. The commission insists the register is clean, robust and ready for election 2024. She, she said this in response to the NDC's concerns about the voters register at an inter-party advisory committee meeting earlier today. Take a look. I believe that as a commission, we have gone out of our way to address issues as and when they come, whether from political parties, whether from civil society, whether from stakeholders and the ordinary citizenry. We've addressed them at a forum that we instituted in 2020, the Let the Citizen Know Forum. 
we commission felt that it was in our interest to demystify the commission and to remove the cloaks of secrecy that had hitherto shrouded our operations. And so today, from A to Z, from registration to the declaration of results, all our processes are open to the public. And that is the beauty of our democracy. And that indeed should engender trust. Chair of the Electoral Commission, Jenna Dokwemen, so there and, and talking about engendering trust and then also the issues that they, she raised, raised the point about the Commission addressing all the issues that the NDC had. Dr. Ashitako Computer is going to be joining us in a bit. But one other matter that came up today, at least, based on the Provisional Voters Register data, as put out by the Electoral Commission earlier today, we do know the provisional data now that, as of today, the valid voters on this provisional voters register, which the Electoral Commission has indicated is subject to continuous you know, validation and, and deletion and correction, 18,772,795 valid voters on this provisional voters register. Plus, females, a breakdown of it, females make up 9,673. Males make up 9,082,622. So you have more females than males on the register, the provisional registers we have it. First time voters, and take a look at this. The first time voters, 708,282. That's for the provisional voters register data of the first time voters. And that's why if you're a political party, obviously, you're gonna be looking at these first time voters and within the first time voters, which of the, the demographics are young people as well, and, and, and how the, the messaging will influence this population of these first-time voters, the special voters, some people who are going to be voting before election day, um, uh, December 7, and all these special voting, uh, which will take place on December 1, all things being equal, 131,475 of the special voters, and you have persons who transfer their votes and that's the subject of the NDC's major concerns as well. In fact, the MPP said they've also identified some errors based on the Electoral Commission data, the votes that were transferred during the period of the Electoral Commission's voter transfer period, 332,110 and proxy voters are those who have elected people others to, to have that right of voting for and on their behalf, 2,167. Based on the Provisional Voters Register, this is the data that Electoral Commission put out earlier today. And as they've indicated, it's subject to the, the, the validation and correction over the period as we have it. But then again, the new Patriotic Party was at the, at the IPAC meeting earlier today. They made a call to the NDC to make their errors available to the public for scrutiny as well. Here's Justin Kodia from Point, General Secretary of the MPP. It bestows on us, irrespective of our political device, to make sure that the peaceful country that we are enjoying remains same after December 7th. Madam well, Chair, not long ago, certain people were asked to hit the street to demonstrate against the Electoral Commission based on what they perceive to be discrepancies and an attempt to rig the election for the new Patriotty Party. Upon several calls from key stakeholders that if NDC indeed have legitimate concerns to raise, we even ask them to do a press conference, invite all of us, walk us through all the allegations that they are talking about. Today, today, as we speak, the NDC is yet to give those so-called allegations and discrepancies to the Electoral Commission. Let it be on record. And for me, I challenge them that all those allegations that they are making and how the Electoral Commission will be able to address the issue, they don't have any further allegations. If indeed they do have it, they should bring it forth for us to interrogate it and see whether the Electoral Commission has addressed it or not. It's not a question about having a leaking roof and mopping uh, uh, your floor. It's about the data, what you presented to the Electoral Commission. The whole people of Ghana want to see it. 
And that is the comment APC made. That even the request for forensic audit is, is, is needless at this point. That's uh, the General Secretary of the MPP, Justin Korea Frempon there. Let's bring in Dr. Arshi Tango Computer. He's the Deputy Director of IT and Elections for the NDC. Dr. Com Computer, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Uh, well, if you, if you can unmute for me, please. Quick. Hello? Well, we, we, we will rectify that connection to the audio of Dr. Rashid Tanko computer. But uh, the NDC put out a press uh, the statement earlier, this was just about an hour ago, we got a copy of that press statement, and they've indicated a number of things. There was a functional executive committee meeting earlier today after that IPAC meeting. And take a look at this. These are the decisions they've reached after this FEC, that's the Functional Executive Committee meeting, um, they deliberated and decided to accept the EC's promise to release to political parties the corrected and updated version of the 2024 Provisional Voters Register for scrutiny within one week as a timeline. Also, the Functional Executive further welcomed the decision by the Electoral Commission to re-exhibit the updated Provisional Voters Register. They, however, recommend that the re-exhibition exercise should be conducted online and offline at the exhibition centers. Also, the NDC demands a multi-stakeholder and inter-party examination of the IT system of the Electoral Commission with the aim of addressing the vulnerabilities that the EC itself has admitted to, which vulnerabilities led to several of the anomalies that have been raised. Plus, the function executive also giving indication of what they want to do next, especially with respect to the matters that have been raised. And, and let's go back on to Zoom and see if we have a clear connection to Dr. Rashid Tanko Computer this time around. Dr. Computer, if you can hear me, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Unfortunately, we, we will try to, to get that connection clear. Um, but still on the matters of election, and stay with me here on your election command center, we'll connect back to Dr. Rashid Tanko, computer. But earlier today, uh, as we did last week, when we, we sat with the diplomatic community to understand their own you know, gauging of what is happening and how they're also reacting to the issues related to the upcoming elections. Last week, we spoke to the Minister in Charge of African Affairs for the, for the UK. Uh, today, I, I sat with the German ambassador to Ghana, Ambassador Daniel Kroll, and he had a few things to share with regards to the elections ahead of us and what, for them, as our partner in development, they're looking at. Take a look. We're just, I would say, weeks away from this election. You, as, as a country, are uh, an integral part of our governance collaboration, not just a business or economic collaboration, but a governance collaboration as well. From where you sit, what, what would be your word or expectation going into the election? My message is that I, I trust in the Ghanaians. The Ghanaians love their democracy and they will make make sure that um, that the, the the will they express uh, at the ballot booth on the 7th of december will be translated uh, into into reality so um, 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 in, in, it's a very complex process. Elections sounds so easy, but you have all these uh, challenges with registration and 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 so on, so on, on. And uh, but at the end, it's uh, it depends on 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 the decision makers, the voters, uh, that they take good care that their vote is being reflected in the result. And I'm 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 convinced Ghanaians uh, love their democracy and they want to uh, see it to continue. They want to live in, 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 a, in, a, in a safe country. They want to live freely. Um, and so they will take... Uh, so you've been following the conversation about, you know, the, the voters register and all of the expectations that the political parties have, is it not? Yes, yes. 
And uh, as I said, it's uh, uh, it's a complex um, que uh, um, challenge uh, in a country where you don't have a, a trusted register. We we don't have this registration process in Germany, so we co we can we honestly cannot give you any advice how to do it best. You know, uh, so for me it's very exciting to listen to the challenges that are related to the to this kind of uh, um, um, setup and. Um, uh, but I understand that it, we are in the process, so it has to, there is, uh, of course, talk about and um, that, uh, um, that the rest is, uh, yet, is not yet uh, um, uh, final and that there uh, are adjustments necessary, needed, and uh, that there, there have been um, um, uh, certain things um, detected so they can be corrected. And so I think we are in a very, um, we are in the necessary fruitful process of, of setting up a, a, a register, register that reflects correctly the realities. Remain your election command center and uh, let's just go back to the Deputy Director of ITN Elections for the NDC, Dr. Rashid Tanko Computer, and see if we have a clear connection to him this time around and, and get the responses, especially um, from the issues that the Electoral Commission has raised concerning the issues that they put up with respect to the, the voters register and the, the Electoral Commission earlier today did a whole presentation addressing some of the issues that the, that's the NDC had brought up and whether that also indeed answers the questions that they had prior to the up IPAC meeting earlier today. Uh, Dr. Rashid Tanko Computer, if you can hear me, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening. Good evening, my brother. And let me say good evening to your cherished viewers. Perfect. Now, I can hear you clearly. Now, first off, uh, the NPP is throwing up the, the invitation to you. They say, organize a press conference and invite them and the other political parties and display the errors and the illegalities you have identified because the Electoral Commission has also done a presentation today indicating they have corrected all the issues that you brought up. Is it one that you're going to consider? Uh, well, Alfred, uh, you, have, you have just seen our, our press statement. Uh, after our marathon IPAC meeting today, uh, we deliberated on the IPAC meeting that we, we held today. And then so we went and held a, a fake meeting to discuss the outcome of the IPAC and we've issued a statement to that effect. Uh, so clearly, our position is spelled out in the, in the statement that we issued this evening. But as to what the NDP is saying, just ignore them with the contaminant, as if they were not at the IPAC meeting. You saw it. The pre your, your reporters were there. The presentation by the Electoral Commission borders on the discrepancies the NDC identified. So which one are they talking about? All the discrepancies that the Electoral Commission talked about were discrepancies identified by the NDC. And it wasn't the EC themselves, they identified those things. So all the corrections that they were talking of were the discrepancies that we gave them. As if they were not listening. I don't know whether they were busy watching movies on their phones or what, when they were doing the presentation. Otherwise, the statement he made was an unfortunate statement. Clearly, the discrepancies that, if you look at the admission by the Electoral Commission, to some of the discrepancies, if we hadn't presented evidence to them, if we hadn't showed them some of the, the issues at stake, how come they were able to identify and, and then solve them? Was it the Electoral Commission that identified the, the over 243,000 uh, old data of transfers added to it? Is it not the same Electoral Commission that admitted that, yes, there was no liveliness check? That is why illegal transfers occurred. Is it not the same electoral commission which says that the IT system is vulnerable? We identify it because people log in uh, credential could be used by even their girlfriends <laughs> to get into the data. So what is the NDP talking about? They should shut up. Oh, well, I mean, but then again, I see in that statement that you, you issued that you have accepted the promise. The electoral commission made a promise to you that within one week, they are going to make available to you, the parties, the corrected provisional voters register. Was that a promise? 
Oh, yes, yes. I mean, this was one of, that's why we, at FEC, we deliberated and said, fair enough, if they say they have corrected almost all the discrepancies, and they are now coming now with a revised provisional register, fair enough, we will take it. We will accept that proposal so that we can take time to also study it, because they've also agreed that they are going to do re-exhibition, Albert Online. That is what they are going to do. We say, fair enough, we have no issue. Look, in any case, we are not antagonizing or fighting the Electoral Commission. They are not our enemies. Let's make it very clear. The Electoral Commission is not an, our enemy. It's not an enemy to the NDC. Neither the NDC is an enemy to the Electoral Commission. We are bigger stakeholders. But we want to make sure that the right things are done. And that is why we have, we have taken this path. And this part we took is helping the Electoral Commission. And that is why they needed to even congratulate and commend the NDC for making sure that their back is properly covered. With this, otherwise, if we hadn't seen all this and allowed this, your guess would have been good as mine come December 7th. Because an illegal president was going to be elected. I based see. on these discrepancies. Well, so, but I want to find out if that timeline of one week was actually mentioned by the EC, that within a week they'll make the corrected PVR available to you, the parties? Yes, he said, in fact, that was their statement. They said within okay. a week they will make it available to us. And thank, thank, thank God, we already have our uh, external draft for them. You remember when we met them on 6th September to have engagement with them about the discrepancies? We okay. gave them our hard drive. And so we have our hard drive with them. As soon as they are ready, they load it for us. We'll take hold of it. We'll study it. And that is what we're saying. You know, there are two issues that we are dealing with. Apart from the register, we're also talking of their IT system. Right. And they and agree. I, and I was coming to that. You said they, they, they agree, agree that, that they agree that they're going to give you access to their IT system, the back end, the protocols, everything? No. No, I'm saying that they agree that their IT system is vulnerable because there was no liveliness check and that login login credentials of officers could be used by others to manipulate the data without even their knowledge. All these things put together, strengthen our position that there's a need to look at the IT system. And you see that in our statement, we are saying that there's a need to have a multi uh, uh, sector CEOs and political parties to come together to come and look at the IT system of the Electoral Commission. I mean, if you look at our statement, we've put yes. it in there. I, I see, because but then... We the, think that there's something wrong with the IT system. Right. But even with that online um, re-exhibition, you say you want it offline as well at the registration centers. Did they ag agree yes, to that? Yes, we are recommending to them. Yeah, we are recommending to them. You know, at that point, they indicated that they wanted to do it online. Yes. Exhibition. But we thought that it's prudent if they can go offline as well. It's the recommendation we are giving to them. That, All right. Look, clearly, what stops you from doing the offline as well? You can send down some of the printed documents so that people can see it. But nonetheless, as a political party, we will take it, we will go and study it when they give it to us. I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here. Dr. Rashid Tanko Computer is Deputy okay. Director of uh, IT and Elections for the NDC. We remain your election command center as we come down to the December 7 presidential parliamentary elections across all media general platforms. But away from issues of elections coming up next, but then again, it still has some tendencies within the election. The organized labor clearly have made their point. They have declared a strike effective October 10 in support of the fight against illegal mining, insisting government declares a state of emergency and bans small-scale mining. Is this a fair act? Well, that's a question that you know, some persons associated to government are asking, but uh, Joshua Ansan, the Secretary General of the TUC, was very clear in his words today at that press conference earlier. Take a look. Following the expiration of our deadline and the failure of government to meet our demands on illegal mining, that is Galamsey, organized labor has decided to declare a nationwide strike 
we differ from October 10th, 2024. We are therefore calling on all workers to stay at home starting Thursday, October 10th, 2024, until government accedes to our demands. There you have it, clear in, the, in their words, and Ken Kumsen uh, is joining us on Zoom right now for a conversation on this matter. And uh, there's organized labor position declaring October 10 as the day they're going on strike uh, to drum home their demands for a state of emergency to be declared. He is the a, a member, in fact, a spokesperson for the a group of organized labor that signed this petition as we have it and then also the communication today of the strike the deputy general secretary of the ghana federation of labor mr kem kumsen good evening thank you for joining us here on ghana tonight well if you can unmute for me and uh, well, while at it I want to find out from you um first off if between now and october 10 if there's any development that meets your expectations and they ask that to put before government, is that going to influence your decision on October 10? Uh, good evening once again. Uh, can I be heard? I can, hear I, you. Clear? I can hear you clearly. Great. So um, the question uh, you ask is... Uh, that if between now and October 10, if any of your demands are met by government, would that influence your decision on October 10? Yes, I mean, uh, the reason for the uh, strike declaration is premised on the demand that was made by organized labor uh, on the 11th of September. Obviously, once government responds to those demands, the strike action will not be necessary because the strike essentially is based on those demands. So yes, if government uh, respond to these demands, then obviously they need to uh, embark on strike or to commence the strike after the notice period will essentially be moot. So that must be place of record. I see, but we're talking about a workforce of oh, almost 700,000. I mean, that is if, the size of labor is anything to go by. Do you have, from what it states now, the buying of the almost 700,000 workforce that on October 10, if we don't see a state of emergency declared and other demands, you're going on strike? Beyond 700,000, the 700,000 figure is actually the number estimated for public sector employees. This strike declaration encompasses all uh, sector employees. These both formal and informal, uh, private sector and then public sector. So you have uh, a, a private sector that also has uh, very huge numbers depending on the sector you're looking at. So the numbers may be more than that. Uh, and the question of whether or not there is a buy-in, uh, I think all of us understand that an essential of life, which is water, uh, if it's poison, polluted, desecrated, for which reason we will become victims of few greedy evil men who, by virtue of wanting to amass wealth, will subject with impunity all of us to this kind of catastrophe. Uh, the question of whether or not we are all for it, uh, I don't think uh, is a question that anybody will blink an eye. Uh, overwhelmingly, every Ghanaian uh, whether employed or unemployed, recognizes that water is an essential of life. And if Ghana Water Company on the 30th of August communicate, communicated unequivocally that if measures are not taken to reverse the trend, Ghana in the next six years may have no option or choice than to import water. The question that arises is how many Ghanaians are what it takes to import water? How many Ghanaians can afford to import water from overseas? If the report from Ghana Water Company is illegitimate, then obviously the discussion is also illegitimate. But if it's legitimate and the source is credible, then we stand in the fork of the road, uh, waiting to see uh, what will happen to us if organized labor, Ghanaians, 
in general do not rise to challenge and to protest against this development. So yes, overwhelmingly there's a support. Mr. Kumsen, I appreciate your time on this one and we'll count down to October 10, which is just some nine days away from today. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Kumsen is Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Federation of Labor, also with the Trade Union Congress. And staying on this matter, let's get into our Young Voters Voices segment. Well, we put this to young voters as to whether illegal mining and the fight against Galamsey will influence their choice of who to vote for. Take a look. I mean, concerning the Galamsey yeah. and then the voting, now, if I vote for you and I, go, I don't get a clean water to drink, what is the essence of me voting for you? You understand me? So, um, if this Galamsey issue is not solved, I don't think me particularly, I will vote. So I say in soon. So I be ya no ya in soon see ya no ma. Ya be ya yare ya be yare. Nti nti mese sam. With the Galamse issue, I think it's a national issue. It will affect the way that we are voting. But looking on the both sides of the political parties, I mean, none of them is saying anything about it. Both parties. It's only the individuals who are I mean, going for the demonstration and other stuff. So for the both parties, they know what they are doing. It's like when they say it, they are thinking that it will affect their vote. So if, if you look on both parties, I mean all the parties, no one is talking about it. It will be part of the reason why I vote because it's something that is affecting us. I mean, our generation, I mean, they will suffer. Me as a citizen, I am not healthy. I am not getting good water to drink. How am I going to vote? If my health condition is not in a good state, how will I be able to go to the pool station to go and cast my vote? So it will be. For now, looking at some statement made by the president saying that he is going to put his presidency on the line to fight for Galamse, which I don't think he has really done that. So for now, if I'm going to vote, I, it has, I mean, it's going to be a factor. Looking at how. What? We we'll put this to a poll and in fact captured in Global Info Analytics. They put that question. How likely is Galamse going to influence your vote? Guess forty three percent of the respondents say it's likely. Nineteen percent are neutral, thirty-eight percent say it's unlikely. Well, we'll leave it to you as well. Uh, the remaining your election command center. We have manifesto check coming up. Stay with us. And this is your election command center manifesto check with focus today. Dennis Barbera Dam, free senior high school policy and the double track system. What's in there? Well, so the conversation has moved from whether or not to review the free senior high school to now whether or not to abolish the double track. Mm -hmm. But of course, I mean, the double track has been con of major concern to many key stakeholders in the, in the space, especially in the education sector. Many are calling for, the, uh, for it to be abolished or to be mm -hmm. ended. Yeah. But um, something interesting happened over the weekend. Let's listen to the education minister when he made a comment about the um, double track system as it stands and what the implications will be if it is ended. Then we get into the books of the, I mean, the manifestos of the parties to see what is in there. Let's listen to the minister first. double <laughs> I did a year in America, I went to California school called Yeno. What say, and yeah, we'll be chum. Now, men can't tell me, my men on my offer, I'm open school, papa, I'm a mama, more multi and what TV so, so much a double track more. I feel a poor quarry, ain't me first student back. They want to abolish the double track system. I can assure you, if they go ahead and do that, school like Opokuari wouldn't be able to admit more students. Thousands of children are likely to remain at home. I see. Yes, yeah, so that's the education minister right there talking about how if the double track system is abolished, 
then chances are that some schools will not be able to admit as many students as they are doing so under the um, double track system. I see. Right. But this has been a problem for even his own government. And they have a vision to do away with this same double track system. Mm. And that's how come when you look at the 2020 manifesto of the MPP, parts of it talks about how they have a plan to phase it out. What he is saying will cause a problem. Yes. I mean, facing it out essentially means that to do away with it. it. Mm -hmm. So in their manifesto, it is captured that we will leverage improved infrastructure towards facing out the double track and harmonize the academic calendar across secondary schools. Now, he says that they say they will abolish it. The day there refers to the NDC. And that's okay. because the NDC also has a similar promise in their 2024 manifesto, which says that the next NDC government will abolish the double track system to restore a stable academic calendar. So the difference between the two is the abolishing and then the facing out. Yes, abolished and facing out. But with the MPP, they make emphasis on improved infrastructure. Okay. However, because the NDC had itemized the things under this policy, they also talk about improving infrastructure and how they'll put in systems just so that, in fact, they even talk about partnering with private schools just so they can use that infrastructure. So the debate now is one is abolishing, one is facing out. But the bottom line is that they admit that the current system that we are running with the double track system is not good enough for us to continue running it. Right. And if you have had interactions with people who are in the senior high school, I have had an encounter where a young lady from one of the schools in Accra tells me that they're on vacation now, they do not know when they're going back to school because mm. the other track is in school now. To be in school. So that's a major challenge. But both parties have promised in their manifestos to abolish and to face out. But as, as usual, there's politics around it. Sure. I mean, but with the MPP, you can understand. It is their baby. They want to protect it. They want to guard it, whichever way possible. And so is it, 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 it abolish or face out? Abolish or face out. Bottom line is that they should just find a way of fixing the system so that we don't have students sit at home mm. not knowing when to go to school, teachers not knowing when they're also going back to school. So in this case, you don't even have the SS1, SHS1, SHS2, SS3 students in school at the same time? No. For some schools. You have them? Yes. But other schools who are running the double track, it's quite uncertain as to how their calendar looks like. The verdict as always... It's with the people, with the people and this is check. As always, and you find uh, this on 3news.com, also TV3 Ghana on Facebook, and also on X. Dennis, thank you. Uh, there's more as well on 3news.com, remain your election command center. On behalf of the rest of the team, thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. Join us same time tomorrow for another conversation. My name is Alfred Okonsi.